get 7% off your first year with DistroKid using the link in the description. We're here in Edmonton, Alberta with Paul Johnson, head of recording at McEwen University. Let's take a peek inside Studio A and see what's next for the future of recording education. Hi, my name is Paul Johnston. I'm head of recording at McCune University, and you are watching Learn Audio Engineering. Hi, Paul. Thanks for joining us. Hi, Alexa. As the head of recording at McCune University, can you tell us about the learning outcomes of your recording program? The learning outcomes are when you get out that you would be able to produce work in a variety of different scenarios in a studio, possibly in production for TV, basically any anything audio related. A lot of these things like TV or gaming, you know, there would be extra learning after, but it, it provides a foundation in audio uh, recording and production. So you're about to release a song, but you don't want to link to dozens of streaming services. Instead, use Hyperfollow from DistroKid. Hyperfollow gives you one link to promote your music, and it gives your fans a one-stop shop to access your new music on the service of their choice. Hyperfollow is a completely free promotional tool to anyone using DistroKit, and here's how it works. The instant your song is uploaded to DistroKid, you can start marketing your release with Hyperfollow. As soon as your release goes live, your Hyperfollow page will automatically update to include links to all streaming services and stores. You're able to edit your Hyperfollow page to include custom links to Bandcamp, social media, or other content. Your Hyperfollow link never changes, so you'll never have to update the links that you set up. You can find your Hyperfollow link on the homepage under Goodies, then Promote Yourself. This is a simple tool that all artists should be using. Get started with DistroKid today and get 7% off your first year using the link in the description. How has the first recording class that you took changed from your intro to recording class today? How has the art of recording changed? Well, I guess I'll start with saying I'm a jazz musician and I, I got interested in recording in high school and at McGill University they have a really recognized recording program that I spent a lot of time in the studio as an undergrad uh, playing and it was, you know, fascinating. And so when I actually started studying in sound recording, there's like a qualifying year for the master's program at McGill. In that year, you don't didn't do any multi-track recording. It was all live to two-track live off the floor, no overdubs. So that's changed quite a bit. I know even at McGill that's no longer the case. It's just not really very realistic um, because technology has moved forward. So from what I learned, I think there's a, a lot of valuable learning in that and I try to incorporate some of those ideas in the class classes that I teach. You know, that idea that you can record live off the floor in one room. When I started recording, we were recording on two, at first, digital audio tape like DAT or DA38s or even a dash machine. So the idea of recording into a computer was quite a bit different. We did do a little bit of that. Uh, I saw Pro Tools a little bit in my recording program, but it was mostly to tape on a large console like this. So speaking of kind of those first recordings, can you tell us about your first recording setup? Oh, uh, my, like my first studio, my own studio? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, when I got out of Miguel, I was working as a mus musician quite a bit, and I had a house with a basement, and so I had a DAT machine. I got a Pro Tools, I think it was called a Digi-01, which was a very basic I think it was Pro Tools 4 or Pro Tools 5. It allowed me to record up to 10 channels of audio at once, and I had a basement set up. So I, I started out with a pair of 414s and some dynamic microphones, and then I got a Coles 4038 and some other microphones. I kind of started growing my collection. But that was my basic first setup, and I got some good preamps, uh, precision, true audio preamps. So that was my setup, and I, I did many records like that. What is your favorite instrument to record? That's an interesting question. I think my I'd have to say that I tend to think more instrumentalists than instruments. So, you know, on any instrument, somebody that can really uh, capture your imagination and really perform something 
truly unique. You know, when I think about my favorite recording moments, they usually involve somebody whose music particularly touched me or, or, or moved me, you know, in, in some way. And I don't think it's really related to the instrument. I think it's more the person. I recorded a fantastic oud player from Turkey and, and he sang and like, holy smokes, was that great? And, uh, you know, it wasn't really music that I was totally familiar with, but it, it transcended all genres for me that I was just like, as a jazz musician, what he could do, like he could he could play jazz just because he was such a good musician, he could do anything. And mm -hmm. Another friend of mine in Bolivia, charango player, which is an instrument, the first time I saw, like really recorded it was, he brought this instrument in and I was like, wow, and he played it and it was like the sun came out. It was like just sunshine mm -hmm. flowing into the studio and I was like, geez, if I could get him to play on all recordings. You know, I can think of some of the great singers I've recorded where you just like, you know, you get goosebumps, it's just amazing, or, or drum. And anything is when somebody really plays something that really moves you, I think is my answer. Do you feel that formal recording training gives home studio producers an advantage? Well, for sure. You know, the old model with white lab coats and people going into a studio and working with the Beatles or Led Zeppelin and learning the ropes, moving up the ranks and, and that kind of uh, apprenticeship is unique and it's a great thing, but there aren't that many opportunities. I think formal training is just a way to, to kind of emulate that in, in any of the arts, really, that it replaces that to some degree. And, you know, I mean, here we are in front of a hugely expensive console that in a home studio you're not going to get an experience on something like this and there are fewer and fewer studios like coming from Montreal I'm just shocked at how many studios are closing and the investment and everything to keep something like this running is so high that there can be very few of them so I think formal training in recording really opens up a variety of possible journeys through the industry you know like you could do so many different things one student that's doing her master's at, in Nashville now is getting really into forensic audio and and voice reconstruction and stuff and you know well Rob is a graduate and, and he's doing this uh, great series people go into gaming they, they go into all kinds of things and some kind of formal training really gives people time to find out what their path is going to be. A lot of people come into a program like this or like the music program in general and they have to pick a major and they don't really know like what they want to do. I mean it was the same for me really. I, I was a performer, I am a performer and, and a musician. I wrote music, I've done all kinds of things and it was just another avenue to pursue and uh, my formal training, I mean, I'm so grateful to, to have gone through the McGill program. And it's opened me up to so many different musical experiences that I wouldn't have gotten just playing. And I think that all of that reinforces everything else and it, it, it creates a more complete uh, musician. So. When Eddie Kramer was asked, do you feel colleges might be training young people for jobs that don't exist anymore, he replied, they're training monkeys, unfortunately. Do you agree? Do you feel that students are getting everything they need to become competent in recording? I've heard from many studios that they have a bias towards people coming out of recording programs. You know, maybe some, some things in the past that didn't go so well, and I certainly think I've really tried to not fall into those kinds of uh, traps. The McGill program is called a Tonmeister program, which is a Eastern European program concept that the Tonmeister or the engineer is somebody that bridges the gap between technology and, and art, really. And so my view of it is that I, I know there's tons of great engineers that don't play music, but the, the vision of the, this program and what we're trying to do is coming from this angle that your musicianship plays a huge role in it. I don't think that's the only answer and I've des definitely felt a little bit of criticism that you know people are coming up and they don't play instruments and they make great music and I do agree with that. To get to the program here and what I think we're trying to avoid as Eddie Kramer said I won't even repeat it but I like to think that 
a student has a lot of options and to find out what interests them and and to leave it open enough to give them that possibility to to follow their own instincts and a motivated student in anything in any school anywhere has those opportunities and and I really make that clear to the students that that they're in charge of their own education we're here to mentor them and to help them and to teach them certain skills that will help them but a skill on its own won't really help you like there's multiple skills that have to overlap the biggest skill in the music industry is is to be able to stay employed. I was always working. I mean, I was always doing projects. I try to bring that into the program here, the idea that you have to be a self-starter. Nobody's going to come and hand you something. I mean, you get breaks, and I don't know if it was Winston Churchill, but he said, the harder I work, the luckier I get. So those skills are really important, networking, and when you don't have work, to, to find work, to find a way to do something that interests you. I think it's just so important, and those are learning outcomes of the program for sure. What's your best advice for landing clients and getting music in front of listeners? Well, okay, my best advice is be really good at what you do. Invest yourself completely. And, you know, don't beat yourself up when you make mistakes, but make sure that you're always doing your best. And then clients tend to come. You know, you, they see that level of commitment. There's, there's a lot of, you know, as I said before, there's a lot of overlapping skills. You need to... Uh, come across with a certain amount of confidence and not that you're trying your hardest and and you know kind of fumbling but just do your best and then clincher there is is word of mouth like I said I didn't have a website I didn't have a business card and I worked all the time because you're going to get a client from every client you work for if all the clients are happy you know when you're starting out maybe you do a couple of projects with friends or something that, that don't pay so well but that lead to something else and always just try to stay positive the networking thing is something you know a, a huge learning outcome here when students come into recording class I say look around at the people around you right now in your cohort because when I think about all of the amazing projects I I've done most of them have one degree of separation to somebody I was in school with that McGill and now they're all over the world I mean you know you spread out so make sure that you treat everybody with respect because everybody is has chosen a career that isn't the easiest one where nothing's going to be handed to you so to, to treat people with respect and do your best it's not always easy and it, it it's a lot of work but but uh it's very rewarding when it does work out so and and to, just to have that kind of faith that that things are going to move forward do you think that having a musical background improves your ability to mix and produce records? Oh, so much so. I mean, you know, you, you've you been a student and Rob as well, and, you know, part of my daily routine is to work on Bach, like a four-part chorales, uh, sing one part, play the other three, go through them. And if I do that for half an hour a day or an hour a day, when I get to mixing, I, I hear the music like it, it kind of animates in a different way and, and you don't have to turn things up as loud to hear them. Like I really do find that a kind of a passion of mine that I, I came to quite a bit later because as I listen to interviews with my favorite artists, Esperanza Spalding, great bass player and singer, somebody asked an interview question, how do you work on independence? And she said like Bach chorales and then like Charlie Parker and... Jaco Pistorius and major influences. A fantastic multi-instrumentalist from Toronto, Don Thompson, was asked what he thought about music education at the university level and what it should be and for different types of music. And he said, regardless of the types of music, the first two years should be devoted to the study of Bach. And he's a jazz musician and we'd lose so many students if we did that. But but for me, for mixing, like that, that kind of independence and the ability to hear um, counterpoint super well, um, hear harmony super well, uh, it, it definitely influences my mixing and I find my mixes are better, I can hear stuff better. So I, I think musicianship is really important and it just helps my playing, my, you know, my mixing and it helps everything. What is some advice that you would give yourself if you were starting in the industry today? That's a good question. I think back to some of my teachers and, you know, when I did the program at McGill, particularly, and you said the industry, because, like, my mind is so 
connected to music that for me the start of the industry career for me is more of a musician than than as a recording engineer or a producer so it's hard to separate those things but one of my teachers Vislav Voschek who started the McGill program when I got into it the program boasted a hundred percent employment rate like graduating because there were four or five students a year and Sony New York took two of them and you know so I was like okay I'm already a freelance musician I'm gonna go do this program and I'm gonna get a job and I can keep playing and by the time I graduated uh, I remember upon graduation Vislav shaking my hand and saying congratulations great job and uh, you know now you're gonna go out into an industry where there aren't jobs anymore but you have all the skill set to do everything so you're gonna find your own way and I thought oh great now I'm freelance again at two things I guess his advice was quite good that similar to a lot of the learning outcomes here is to, to find your own path and as a young musician I think a lot of the time we feel that practice or hard work doesn't always pay off and I just think it's that faith that if you do put the hours in and you work hard at it and you apply yourself that it will pay off. Sometimes it's hard to keep that at the forefront of your mind, you know, but it definitely does. How do you feel about analog modeled plugins? Do you think that they are close enough to the real thing? Well, they, they've come a, a really, really long way. When I graduated from McGill and I was used to working on a Sony console and, you know, tape and everything, I found that my first projects using my Digio One and mixing at home, that they weren't sounding as good as my master's work at, uh, at university. My instinct there was just to use less plugins. You know, and really go a lot of the principles that we were taught is, you know, if you record it well, you shouldn't need a whole bunch of other stuff. So the debate of, of plugins or analog versus digital, I, I really do agree m mostly with the idea that it's in the hands of the user, really. You can make anything work. I did one record where I mixed it all analog and then there was a problem and I had to go back and I mixed half of it digital after. I'd say I'm 50-50 on which mixes I prefer and the process is so different that, you know, that's the biggest change. It's not so much the plugins, it's the way you can use them. I tend to find with analog gear that y you get a kind of more global focus, like you're a little more hands-off, you can't get as detail-oriented, or you can't tweak things to that level. It's limiting, but in its limitations, there's magic in there. I think that these days of the interviews that I've heard with, with big producers, a lot of people are using hybrid setups and at home that's what I have. I have a hybrid setup, I have a bunch of analog gear that I use, but a lot of it is, is in the box as well. What do you perceive to be the impact of COVID on local recording studios? Do you think local and global recording studios shutting down is larger than the pandemic? I have done quite a bit of recording. I'd say that recording s since the beginning of the pandemic has been, for a lot of people, the, the one way to express themselves musically. So there's possibly been more recording. Recording studios, I think the problem, you know, that we talked about with recording studios shutting down everywhere is not related to COVID. I mean, it, it started a long time ago, you know. Home computers and the change of technology and everything has made recording available to everybody. And now in the pandemic, we're seeing, you know, university programs where people are recording big bands with one instrument at a time on an iPhone. Everybody is, is getting into it a little bit. And I don't see that as being an extra problem for recording studios because it's not the same thing. It's always nice to get back to your roots. Join us next time at Royal Studios, where McEwen grad Arnell shows us the recording space that he's built. Thanks for watching and please subscribe to Learn Audio Engineering.